Hayes covering Marvin Harrison, and he gets it up and over, layers it, and Harrison stretches out to make the catch. That's outstanding. This, I'm telling you, this guy, the sky is the limit for Marvin Harrison Jr. I truly believe that this man right here on your screen will be the best receiver in the NFL in about four or five years. What is going on? Welcome to the middle of the week, folks. All right, we got Wednesday happening. It is the Joel Klatt Show. I'm Joel Klatt. Uh, lots to get into. I can't wait for this episode. I, I, we've got some really cool stuff today. First, though, remember, Monday, uh, we had a great episode. Make sure if you missed it, go back and check that one out. Uh, really a deep dive on that Ohio State win. I talked about Oregon, TCU. Uh, there was some good stuff in that one. So make sure to go back and uh, check that one out. Um, this this episode though we got to check in right we got to check in on some more uh, some programs that might be falling short of expectation and I'm going to give you a very blunt assessment about exactly where they're at and exactly where we think they're probably going to go at least where I think that they're probably going to go by the end of the year so uh, let's get into it let's get into it right away and uh, let's start with the Texas Longhorns all right Texas. Uh, what a disappointing loss that was to Oklahoma State for Longhorn fans because you got the sense after some of their play with Quinn Ewers at quarterback that this team had the ability to go out and win all their games. And, and listen, they do. Um, listen, that's still a really good team. And it's still, at least by any metric that you throw out there, is much better than their 5-3 and three record. Let's not forget that this is a team that was unranked to start the year. They they have at one point been in my top 10. And by the way, all four of these at some point this year have been in my top 10. Okay, so, so that's what kind of ties them all together. That's the glue that binds these four teams. And, and Texas was in the top 10 for me at one point. Remember, I saw that game against Bama. We all did. And they played right with them, toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And save for... A missed tackle or two and, and an injury, you know, that game might have gone the, the different direction. And they played them as well as Tennessee did. Uh, I think that we could all agree with that. And Tennessee made those couple of plays and won, and good on them, by the way. And Texas didn't and lost. Uh, but now they're five and three. So you get the sense like, oh, here we go again with Texas. Here we go again in year two of Steve Sarkeesian when they blow another double-digit lead. Now, albeit this one was from early in the game, but in every one of these losses that they've had this year, they've been at least tied or leading at some point in the fourth quarter. Remember, their tech loss actually went to overtime. So they're closer than I think a lot of people want them to be. And this is still a team that I believe is not only going to win a lot of games through the course of the end of the year, but will win most of their games during the course of the end of the year. So at five and three, you look at the rest of their schedule, and it's pretty easy to say, yeah, they're going to win at least two, three, maybe even all of them. Here's what they have coming up. They're at Kansas State. Not saying that's going to be easy. They're TCU at home. Not saying that's going to be easy. By the way, that's the Big 12. Every single week, you're going to have to play your best in order to win. And then they've got Kansas on the road. And I know what everyone's going to say. It's like, well, hey, Kansas has their number. Yeah, maybe. And then Baylor at home. So not easy. And could they go 2-2? Two and two? Yes. Could they go 1-3? and three? Yes. If things don't go well. Could they go 4-0? and oh? Yes, they could. So what's holding them back? What's the problem with Texas this year? Why are they 5-3 and three with all this talent in Sarkeesian's second year? Details. Little things. Little details are holding them back right now from being 7-1, and 6-2. and two. And it's really easy to see that. In their three losses, they've lost by a total of seven points. Okay, you had the, the missed corner blitz against Bryce Young. Um, obviously, some officiating goes the other way. And, and that game could have been a win for Texas. Bijan Robinson, who doesn't generally put the ball on the ground and is one of the best backs in the country, fumbles in overtime at Tech. And they ended up losing the game. I mean, wild, wild. Uh, and then this last week, what was it? 14, 15 penalties to zero? No, granted, there were a couple of flags thrown on Oklahoma State and they um, were not taken. So that's why the stat sheet is going to say no penalties. There were a couple of flags thrown on Oklahoma State, but they were never accepted. But having said that, 
at the end of the game, I'm watching this, and here's Quinn Ewers, not a runner, runs, I think it was like a 45, 50, 55 yard run late in the fourth quarter, holding. Right. So you you are you are inches away from a seven and one team. Six and two easy, seven and one, maybe even eight no. So that's why I'm not quite as worried is because Texas needs to correct small issues. The devil is in the details for Steve Sarkeesian and this team. Now, I will tell you that I'm a big believer that, and we used to have this sign up when I played at Colorado, we used to have this sign up and and a lot of teams still do. They have this sign that it's like, greatness is realized through the attention to details. And I think that that probably stands the test of time and it doesn't matter if it's football or if it's in the business world anywhere you go and anywhere you're trying to achieve something great you can say that greatness is realized through the attention to details and right now texas is falling just a little bit short i think they're actually better and closer on the detail side than they were a year ago so i'm seeing small growth but it has to be frustrating for a fan base that feels like they've got the talent to be seven and one or eight no and on the precipice of a big 12 title and maybe even a playoff berth and here they are sitting at at five and three and you think to yourself here we go again i d- I just don't think it's going to be here we go again for Texas. Small things that can and will get corrected. Remember now, do you really think Quinn Ewers is going to continue to play that poorly? See, I don't. I remember vividly what it was like to start for the first time on the road, in particular in league play. And it's hard. It's hard. My first start was at Kansas State against a very good Kansas State team that went on to win the Big 12 championship and beat Oklahoma that year. Darren Sproles was on that team. Terrence Newman was on that team. Like They, they had a, a really good football team. And, and I, I will tell you that that felt wild for the first time as a quarterback to go out there on the road. So do I think he's going to play as poorly as he did last week against Oklahoma State? No, no, I don't. I think that those are the natural maturation process. Those are the natural lumps and bruises that you've got to go through as a quarterback to come out the other end. Quarterback is is a lot of trial by fire. It's very rare that you get a guy that just goes out there, starts, and in his first year is brilliant. You know, guys like that are like Jameis Winston, won it, Heisman in his red, redshirt freshman year. That doesn't happen all the time. Now, is it just me? I, I've got people out there, and I know that some of you think they're like, oh, Joel's just a Texas apologist. But it's not just me. When you actually look at some of these like more analytical um, stat categories, like the FPI, uh, like the Sagarin rating, they'll show you that Texas is is way closer to 6-2, six, 7-1, six and 8-0 and oh, than they are 5-3. and three. Texas right now in the FPI is 6th in the country. Texas right now in the Sagarin rating is 11th in the country. So by all the metrics, it's like this team is very good. They're 5-3. and three. It's probably the worst that they should be at this point in the season. And if they correct some of those small details, you're probably going to see a team that ends up with 8, 9, maybe even if they run the table and win a bowl game, 10 wins. And then obviously that would be a huge success in Sarkeesian's second year. They also, by the way, and this is a big one, they have answers to this, right? You can develop your quarterback. He can get better. They have answers at that position, which is very important, and I'll get into that uh, as we go on in this um, this podcast. Okay, let's let's move on. Okay, we got three other teams to cover. Who's next? The Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Yeah, so Notre Dame, right? Like, Notre Dame is disappointing. There's no doubt about it. And I, I looked at Notre Dame for a, a long time. Now, they were, they started the year in, in fifth, um, even in the preseason, I thought that they played pretty well against Ohio State, in particular with a brand new head coach, in particular breaking in a new quarterback. Now they've lost that quarterback. They're on to their backup. Not everything has gone right for them. They lose the second game. But if you haven't been paying attention, they are getting a little bit better. And I think that Marcus Freeman is actually doing a decent job. Now they're four and three, and you could be saying to yourself, like, yeah, but they haven't dominated. And you're right. They haven't been dominant at all. But they are getting better. They start 0-2, and in their last five games, they're 4-1. Granted, the Stanford loss was not good, and I'm not going to uh, be an apologist for Notre Dame on that game. It's it's not a good look, that loss, because Stanford is not very good. But 4-1 in their last five, and then these elements that I say Notre Dame needs 
in order to be a really good team, have gotten better. They have developed a little bit during the course of the year, even with a backup quarterback. One of those is the ability to run the football. Okay, so in the first two weeks, Marshall and Ohio State really stymied their ability to run the ball. And I thought it was something that coming into the year, they were going to be able to lean on. Their offensive line was developing last year. I think that they're better this year, although I still think that they need further development. Obviously, they're four and three. But if you actually look and you kind of dig in, it's like, how are they running the ball? What you'll see is in each of the first two games, they did not average four yards per carry in either one of those games. Since then, they have in almost every one of these. They have run for over 150 yards in every single game since the first two. They did not touch 150 in the first two. And in fact, in two, or excuse me, three of the four, they've run it for over 220 yards. So they're getting better running the football. So here you have a team with a friend, a brand new first year head coach in Marcus Freeman, and you lose your starting quarterback. It doesn't go well from you, but they continue to get better. And I actually think when I look at the rest of their schedule, they're four and three right now. This easily is a bowl team. They've got to go two and three in the rest of their games in order to go, go to a bowl game. And I think that that's a win in particular after how the season started. They're going to go to Syracuse, tough game, Clemson at home, Navy, Boston College, and then at USC. They've got to win two of those games. You clearly look at Navy and BC and you think to yourself, yeah, Notre Dame can and probably should win both of those games. And I actually think, I'll just put it out there right now, I believe that they win one of the other three. I think that they beat either Syracuse, Clemson, or USC. It's going to be tough against Clemson and USC because they're losing the talent battle on that one. I, I do think that they're going to play well at Syracuse. Syracuse is coming off of that really emotional loss on the road uh, against Clemson, and I think that that's a tough game for Syracuse because of the development for Notre Dame. So here's a team that starts in the top five. There's 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 a lot of, of pressure on Marcus Freeman. They've got a brand new starting quarterback. He goes down, Tyler Buckner. They've got to go to Drew Pine. Things have not gone their way, and here they are developing, getting better, and trying to control the controllables. If they're able to run the ball like they have in the last three of the last four games, then they will win two of these and maybe three and end up going to a bowl game. So let's say that they win three and they finish the year, and there they are, a seven-win team. Okay, so they're seven and five. They go to some you know nondescript bowl and they get a win and they're eight wins. Don't you feel a lot different about Notre Dame if they're an eight win bowl win team versus where they sit right now in four and three? See, but that's the trajectory that they're on because they're improving. And I think Marcus Freeman's actually doing a nice job. Last thing on Notre Dame, and one of the reasons why I'm not all that worried about where they're at right now, they're recruiting really well, really well. So their trajectory in the season is going up. And, and also in the offseason and for the program is going up. I believe they're third in the country right now, and, and it changes all the time based on commitments. But for next year's recruiting class, I believe they're third ahead of a team like Ohio State. So they're recruiting at an elite level right there with Alabama and Georgia. And you never know. Maybe they're going to close a couple of these guys late and uh, end up getting them at Notre Dame. So Notre Dame, 4-3, and three, been very disappointing. Started the year 0-2, but the year is starting to trend up. The offseason is starting to trend up, and that's why I'm not quite as worried about Notre Dame as maybe some others that I'll talk about in a moment. All right, next up. The Oklahoma Sooners. Oklahoma has desperately got to get better on defense, and that's the biggest issue by far. By far. And, and those that don't really know what's going on will say, like, well, they were shut out against Texas. Yeah, but they didn't have their quarterback. It was... That was offensively always going to be a tough game because Dylan Gabriel wasn't in there for them. He was banged up. And their defense, though, is giving up that amount of points all the time. Oklahoma has given up 40-plus points in four straight games. All league games. That can't happen. That can't even, even in a win. Now, let's back up for a moment. Part of that is because the Big 12 is very good offensively. And I think that that's... That's difficult on defenses, right? So even when you play Kansas, they're really good on offense. And although Oklahoma won the game and scored over 50 points, you know, there's Kansas with over 40 points in that game. So it was Kansas State, then TCU, then Texas, and here comes Kansas, and all of them score 40 points. They've got to fix that. And the troubling part for me about OU is that although their coach is a first-time head coach and a new first-year head coach at this location, 
that's his sweet spot. So doesn't it feel a little bit different than, like, let's say Notre Dame, who's played okay on defense and certainly is a defense that you would expect to get better. But when this is your cornerstone, Brent Venables made his name as a defensive coordinator, both at OU and at Clemson. Guy's been in like, oh gosh, I'm going to get the number wrong, but I think it's like eight national title games, seven, eight national title games since 2000 as a coordinator. Like he knows how to play at the top end and he comes in and OU is bad. They are bad on defense. We tried to explain this in the preseason by saying, listen, they lost too many guys off of their defense. They lost uh, their leader in sacks, leader in tackles, tackles for loss and interceptions. That was going to be too much to overcome just on that side of the ball alone. But remember, they also lost a couple of quarterbacks. They also lost Kennedy Brooks, who had rushed for 1,000 yards in three different seasons at Oklahoma. They also lost their offensive play caller. They also lost their head coach. So in some respects, you can ex- understand why they're in this predicament. But the troubling part is the defense. The defense has got to improve. It's got to improve. Offensively, they're doing okay. Not great, but okay, and they'll continue to get better. If Dylan Gabriel is in the lineup, then they can beat anybody left on their schedule. And it's not an easy schedule. Similar to Texas, they could lose a lot of these games. They could win a lot of these games. When I look at their schedule, they're going to have what has become, and this is wild, a basement dweller game against Iowa State. These two are in the cellar in the Big 12. Then they've got Baylor at West Virginia, the Bedlam game, and then at Texas Tech. None of them easy. Probably the easiest one, West Virginia. By record, easiest one would be Iowa State. But at Iowa State, I think is much more difficult than, let's let's say, West Virginia. Although playing the Mountaineers there in Morgantown is, is uh, no easy task. Oklahoma needs two wins out of those five games in order to go to a bowl. Don't you think they're going to get that? See, I do. So even if the defense just improves a little bit with Dylan Gabriel at quarterback... This is still a top 25 total offense. Now, they're 120th in total defense, so that needs to improve a little bit. But I do think that this is a team that's going to end up getting those two victories and end up being a bowl team. And I think that that's good for Oklahoma. I came into the year, and if you'll remember this, and OU fans, you hated me for saying this. I said, this is one of those years that they're probably going to take a dip, and they might lose more games than they ever lost under Bob Stoops at least post-2000. And everyone's like, oh, you're the worst. You're a snake. You love Lincoln Riley. And bottom line is, it's just the nature of how much they lost. And that's playing out before us. If their defense can get a little bit better, their offense is pretty good. Two wins in the last five, I think, is certainly something that you can expect from them. All right, last one. The Texas A&M Aggies. Oh, 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 oh boy. Buckle up. Um, have you noticed that every other team on this list, there's some positivity, right? There's some hope. Either you have like a first year head coach and you expect to get a lot better. There's been some development during the course of the year. There's a schedule that you feel like, yeah, we can get the requisite games in order to be a bowl team. There's none of that at Texas A&M. None of that. This is not good. A&M is in a really bad place. So let's take a look first at where they're at before we can evaluate or even suggest where they need to go from here. They're three and four, and this is a team that is much different than, let's say, their state brethren in the University of Texas, which is much closer to six and two and seven and one than five and three. A and M is three and four, and they're way closer to one and six than they are even what? You know, six wins for sure. They are not a very good team right now. You've got all of the suspensions happening. They've had injuries, and obviously nothing you can do about that. But more than that, they're just not very good on offense. Did you know that South Carolina and Granite, they lost the game, but that was the first FBS team this season that they outgained in a game? That's not very good. So even when they did win, 
You could say that they didn't really dominate the game and really didn't even come close to dominating the game. They won in spite of themselves against Miami. They won in spite of themselves in, in, in the case of Arkansas as well. Remember, Miami was pitiful in the red zone, had to settle for some field goals. a and took advantage and good on them. Arkansas had them dead to rights. They're going to go up two scores, and all of a sudden, K.J. Dever- Jefferson thinks that he's like Michael Jordan from Space Jam, and he's going to two-foot jump from the five-yard line to go into the end zone. And then that crazy play happens, and then A&M ends up winning the game. Like, this is this is so close to being a two-win team or a one-win team with their only win against, who was it, like Sam Houston State. Now, for them, at least they've got UMass coming up. Look at the rest of their schedule. They're three and four, and they need three wins out of this schedule in front of you. Ole Miss... Florida, at Auburn, UMass, thank you very much, SEC November Cupcake, and then LSU. Well, LSU is getting way better. I don't think that they're better than Florida. Who knows if they're better than Auburn? And there's no way they're better than Ole Miss. Remember, this is not a team that's like showing signs of growth. They've got a bunch of guys, including some of their best players, that now have been suspended indefinitely because of this locker room interaction, uh, altercation, whatever you want to call it, after the South Carolina game. Uh, This is not a good state of affairs for Texas A&M, and this is not a first-year coach. This is not a coach that his side of the ball is excelling, a little bit like Brent Venables, but it is woefully falling short right now. Texas A&M on offense is 108th in total offense and 109th in scoring offense. That has to get better somehow, some way, right? This is a team that, yes, the talent is young, but they're number four in the country in terms of the talent composite. They're the fourth most talented team in the country, and they probably should be two and five, maybe even one and six right now. That is Wild. Wild. Now, I will give them this. A lot of that talent is really young. They have 10 five-star players that were recruited as five-star players on their team. Nine of them are sophomores or freshmen. Eight of them are actually freshmen. So really young, and I understand that. So they've got to develop. But have we seen anything develop in Jimbo Fisher's five years? Because I haven't. Their offense has gotten worse The talent at wide receiver doesn't develop. The offensive line hasn't developed. He can't get the quarterback position right at all. It it continues to, to fall short of what you would call championship caliber or the standard in the SEC. So this is this is not a good spot right now. And I think that they are, even if you gave them. So, yeah, they're going to beat UMass. But then they've got to win one of those other games that it's like, are they going to win? I don't know. Just to be 5-7. and seven. They haven't been sub-500 five 5-7 and seven since 2009 under Mike Sherman. Like, this, this, is, this is a bad deal. And why is it a bad deal? There's nowhere to go. Okay, so every other one of these examples, I talked about where they can go. Texas, small details. They can get better. Notre Dame is getting better. The recruiting's getting better. Everything you can say is on the up. Right, Brent Venables is recruiting really well, and you would think that a guy with his pedigree is going to develop the defense. Now, we'll see if that comes true or not, but you would think that that's going to develop, so it's trending up Okay, with Dylan Gabriel. They're going to go to a bowl game. Texas A&M, they don't have that, and you're in the fifth year with this guy Jimbo Fisher and just gave him $95 million. So they just signed away all their leverage. See, normally an athletic director could go to a coach and say, you've got to change your offensive staff. You've got to do something different. And, and you could see that like, yeah, of course, right? Of course you're going to have to, your head coach is trying to call the play. You're 108th in total offense, 109th in scoring offense. Of course you're going to have to change, but what leverage do they have over Jimbo Fisher? None. They don't have any leverage over him. His buyout at the end of the year is 85.95% million dollars guaranteed he's sitting there saying please i wish you would i mean can you imagine having that contract he's got all the leverage he doesn't have to change if he doesn't want to who's walking in the room and telling him he has to change he says or what see that's why they're in such a predicament at texas a&m this contract that they just gave him is awful fully guaranteed Nine and a half a year? 
Pay him $85.95 million. By the way, even if it's bad next year, great. Pay me my $76 million. I mean, are you kidding me? So this is this is this is hard, right? This this is hard. And I'm not just trying to 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 jump on and hammer Texas AM. I'm not. I'm just saying, as a program, there's there's programs that have hope that have been disappointed, and then there are programs that don't really have hope. And right now, for Texas AM, I don't know if they have hope. So let's recap where we're at. Okay, so let's recap all of this. We've got these four programs. We had Texas, we had Notre Dame, we had Oklahoma, and now Texas AM. Texas is like inches away from being even 8-0, right? You can see it. A couple of bounces of the football, and they're right there. They're going to be fine, and you would think that that would continue. Now, do they have to hold on to Lee's better? Yes. Does their quarterback have to develop? Yes. But it's there. Sark has a track record with quarterbacks. All of it is there. Small things, and they're right there. So I feel the best about Texas of these four programs. Then you've got these two programs with first-year head coaches. Never been head coaches before, first-year head coaches, and they're starting to find their footing a little bit. Even Oklahoma, who got shellacked by Oklahoma, they get their, or excuse me, by Texas, they get their quarterback back and they're able to win a game. I know it's tough, but that defense should start getting better. The offense at least is good enough to go out there and get you a couple of wins and go to a bowl. Notre Dame the same way. They're getting better. They're developing. They're 4-1 in their last five games. The run game is getting better. You would think with their schedule that they're going to be able to go to a bowl game. So here's these three teams that it's like, okay, they've been disappointing, but you're probably going to get to that carrot at the end of the year and go to a bowl game. A&M, probably not the case. A&M is probably not going to to a bowl game with a head coach in his fifth year that the buyout is $85.95 million. That's rough. That's rough. I think one of the things, if you're looking for hope for Texas A&M, is their quarterback, their their young quarterback. I believe it's Connor Wegman. And and Connor's a really talented player. He got in uh, against South Carolina, and I'm interested to see what he brings to the table. It makes me wonder, though, if he's going to be really good, then why wasn't he playing anyways? Because the quarterback play that they've had to this point in the season hasn't been close to good enough. So that always makes me think, like, he's clearly not ready because Jimbo would be desperate to put anybody else in there because Haynes King ain't the answer, right? They need better quarterback play, and they need it desperately. So where does that leave A&M? The other ones, you feel like, okay, they're going to be all right. Where does that leave them? They need to adjust. Okay, so this is going to become an offseason where they're going to miss a bowl game, most likely. And Jimbo Fisher is going to have to look deep, deep, deep down within his own program and make hard choices. And other head coaches have had to do this throughout the history in college football, by the way. I've wrote down some amazing head coaches, national championship winning head coaches, guys that have built programs that have had to make tough decisions about themselves calling plays or about longtime coordinators that have been calling plays or about just adjusting to style. You want me to go through them? Let's just start with this. Do you remember Mike Gundy used to be the play caller for Oklahoma State? It wasn't until he gave up play calling duties that Oklahoma State really took off to what they are now, which is a team that usually every year or every other year is going to win 10 games. Let's see. Bob Stoops. uh, What was it? 2011, 2012. He had Josh Heupel. Heupel had won a national championship for him, but he needed a change. He changed his entire offensive staff and brought in Lincoln Riley. That was an adjustment that worked. Right away, they were better. Right away, they were better. Gary Patterson did this at TCU. He was a defensive-oriented head coach that wanted to win a very specific way. And he he realized once they got into the Big 12, I need to change. He brought in Sonny Cumbie and Doug Meacham, and boom. Right away, they were a playoff-caliber team, co-champions in the Big 12 with Baylor. Mike Bellotti did this at Oregon. Right, They were pretty good. And then he went out and adjusted and brought in Chip Kelly as an offensive coordinator. And it really made them take off. Those adjustments paid off huge. Urban Meyer did it with Ohio State bringing in Ryan Day. That offense is light years better than it was before Ryan Day got there. Their program is better since Ryan Day got there. Nick Saban has done this. Yes, he was winning national championships, but he realized when he lost to Clemson and Deshaun Watson, when he was facing guys like Johnny Menzel, that he needed to adjust on the offensive side, and he did. He went out and he brought in Lane Kiffin, and then he brought in Steve Sarkeesian. He started recruiting different styles of quarterback. These guys all adjusted. This is like the the royalty 
By the way, another national champion, Ed Ogeron, did this. He knew that he was going to need a transfer quarterback and maybe a different play caller brings in Joe Brady and Joe Burrow in order to adjust, and they won a national championship. So Bob Stoops, Gary Patterson, Mike Bellotti, Urban Meyer, Nick Saban, Mike Gundy, Ed Ogeron, and there's probably countless more, but you think, Jimbo Fisher, that you're not that you're better than these guys? Adjustment is needed at Texas A&M, and it's going to have to start this offseason. I think he knows that, and we'll see where it goes. This day and age, though, it can happen quick. And I bring up that LSU example. It happened quick with Joe Burrow and Joe Brady. And Texas A&M, by the way, they're probably one really good young play caller and one transfer quarterback away from being really good right away because they are a talented roster, even without developing uh, a quarterback up to this point. Joe Burrow walked into LSU, and it's like they hadn't really enjoyed that top-end national championship success under Ed Ogeron. They were waffling a little bit as a program, now better than what A&M is right now, but they needed the infusion, and there it was with a guy like Burrow. So maybe they're going to get that. I don't know who it is. You look around the country, I don't know who it is, but I think that that's what they need. So there you go. There you have it, okay? Those are the four programs. They're all in disappointing spots right now, but there's kind of a state of what's going on with these four programs that all, at one point, have been in my top ten. Uh, that's going to do it for today. Tomorrow, we're going to come out with uh, some game previews and predictions, which I always love. So that'll be tomorrow, so make sure to tu- tune in tomorrow. Uh, and remember to go down and or go back and download Monday's episode as well. Remember to tell a friend about the show. This is the Joel Klatt Show. You can follow us on social media at Joel Klatt Show. You can follow me at Joel Klatt, and you, know, you can watch me get in petty internet fights with other people around the country, which is stupid, but it happens. And it's kind of funny on Mondays. So check it out at Joel Klatt on Twitter. Uh, Tune in tomorrow, folks. We got a really good episode coming for you tomorrow. And thank you for listening today.